first introduce myself. Uh, this is uh, Bo Chen, um, uh, one of the uh, council member of uh, Hong Kong IR. Well, I'm about to uh, introduce to uh, you uh, this uh, very interesting uh, webinar on blockchain, uh, NFTs, and the metaverse implications for disputes and the dispute resolution process. Well, our two uh, uh, known the speakers, uh, Dr. Adam, uh, partner uh, Brian Bird in the uh, dispute resolution group in Paris, is the head of the firm's uh, arbitration practice in France, and a member of our dispute uh, resolution team in the uh, UAE. And he offers uh, clients with uh, long-standing and cross-border expertise in managing international dispute and arbitration. Uh, Ms. Claire Fanny, uh, associate at Bert and Bert, um, having joined uh, the group uh, Paris uh, office uh, of Bert and Bert as a trainee back in uh, 2019, with a particular focus on commercial arbitration. Claire has worked on disputes across a range of sectors, including construction, infrastructure, energy, insurance, real estate, and public procurement. Her practice also extends to uh, investment treaty arbitration. Well, without further ado, uh, let me put our hands together to welcome our two speakers. And I wish uh, perhaps uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes, we can have a Q&A session. Uh, in case, um, of course, we welcome questions. Please put your questions in the chat box. Okay, let me uh, hand over the phone to our two speakers, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Vaud. Thank you, uh, um, uh, Jan. It's a pleasure to be uh, participating to this webinar. Um, very much looking forward to being in Hong Kong again. Uh, some, sometime soon, I hope, when, uh, um, when health um, uh, circumstances will allow it, uh, together with uh, uh, hopefully also Claire. Um, I uh, also want to thank uh, VHKIRB uh, for inviting us uh, to speak about this very hot, uh, promising and um, quite challenging topic, I must say. Uh, we hope um, what we'll be covering uh, will be of sufficient interest. Some uh, uh, points we will be um, talking about are very much um, coming from Asia and, and actually China. Um, this is where we, we, we found some very, um, very nice and telling illustrations um, about some of the legal points we will be covering. Uh, what we suggest we do is uh, that we divide somehow in, in two, but a little bit uh, uh, less um, our presentation with Claire presenting the technical side of the different creatures, uh, let's call them like this way, blockchains, NFTs, and the metaverse, how they function legally speaking, after which I will be uh, trying to explain to you how uh, those um, legal creatures, um, if one can use this, this term, uh, interact with arbitration and what sort of disputes uh, they can have and will generate. Um, Claire, the, the, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everyone. And um, thank you to the HKIRB uh, for having us today and um, to Mr. Chan for the introduction and um, very pleased to participate in this webinar today. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. In recent months, uh, tech giants, international brands, and artists have invested millions of dollars in the metaverse and blockchain, te blockchain technology, and it's only the beginning. However, at, and as many of us are wondering, and perhaps this is why you joined the webinar today, how can legal concepts created for the physical world protect investors in this new virtual environment? 
certainly these new technologies will give rise to complex and novel legal issues. And it's our view that international arbitration will play a key role in the resolution of these new disputes. Next slide, please. Um, as Jill mentioned, um, I will cover the basics of uh, these technologies, blockchain, NFTs, and finally, um, the metaverse. First, we will cover the blockchain. Blockchain is a shared immutable ledger that facilitates the process of recording transactions and tracking assets in a business network. An asset can be tangible or intangible, and virtually anything of value can be tracked and traded on a blockchain network. This way, risk is reduced and costs are cut for all the parties involved. Next slide, please. Uh, there are three, uh, there are a few key elements of the blockchain to keep in mind. Uh, first, as I just mentioned, it's an immutable ledger. So, it, and it's also distributed. Um, um, this relies on distributed ledger technology, whereby all network participants have access to this ledger and it's immutable record of transactions. Using this ledger, transactions are recorded only once eliminating the duplication of effort that's typical of traditional business networks. Another key feature of the blockchain is that it's immutable, so it allows for the creation of immutable records. This way, no participant can change or tamper with the transaction after it's been recorded to the ledger. And finally, you may have heard about smart contracts. Smart contracts are basically programs that are built into the into blockchain technology. They contain a set of rules um, referred to as a smart contract, where um, it, basically the smart contract defines conditions. Um, if they're met, then something will happen. For example, when John pays Mike 300 ether, then John will receive ownership of the house. This has the benefit, um, as I think I touch upon later, that um, it's more efficient, so it, it contributes to market efficiency by cutting out um, intermediaries. Next slide, please. So how, how does the blockchain work? As each transaction occurs, it is recorded as a block of data. Those transactions show the movement of an asset that can be tangible or intangible. Each block is connected to the ones before and after it. They're therefore forming a chain. Um, these blocks form a chain as yes, it moves from place to place or ownership changes hands. Um, transa transactions are blocked together in an irreversible chain. So I mentioned before it's immutable, it's irreversible, thus forming the blockchain. As each additional blocks are added, they strengthen the verification of the previous block and hence of the entire blockchain. This renders the blockchain tamper evident and delivers one of the key uh, benefits of blockchain, which is immutability. Blockchain has many different applications, including tracking music royalties, cross-border payments, personal identity security, um, anti-money laundering tracking system, as well as facilitating um, the buying and selling of NFTs, which I will um, now cover. Next slide, please. So what are NFTs? NFTs are, um, so non-fungible tokens, are cryptographic assets on a blockchain with unique identification codes and metadata that distinguish them from each other. Unlike cryptocurrencies, they cannot be traded or exchanged at equivalency. NFTs shift the crypto paradigm by making each token unique and irreplaceable, thereby making it impossible for one NFT to be equal to another. They are also extensible, meaning you can combine one NFT with another to breed a third unique NFT. Some examples of NFTs include digital artwork, um, such as the Christie's digital um, uh, work called Every Days, which sold uh, for 69 million US dollars in March, 2021, making it the most expensive piece of digital art that was ever sold. 
NFTs also have application in the domain of real estate, digital and non-digital um, collectibles, and domain names. Um, next slide, please. There are many benefits of NFTs. Um, some of them echo the benefits of blockchain because as, um, as I covered, NFTs rely on blockchain technology. The first benefit um, is security. They, they offer unparalleled security and safety. And you can um, be confident that the NFTs are not, are, they're less subject to fraud than other assets. Um, second benefit is enhanced authenticity. So this goes back to the question of fraud. Um, they are um, unique uh, because the blockchain is an integral component in their development. And in addition to being unique, they are indisputably authentic by virtue of the fact that they are stored on the blockchain, which cannot be tampered with or, or changed after the um, blocks are successively added. Um, blockchain technology also ensures that NFTs cannot be withdrawn, replaced, or altered, which also further enhances um, the, um, their authenticity. Third is that NFTs offer ways to um, verify the ownership of each NFT, which also contributes to their uh, value, of course. Um, <clears throat> and that's because they're held on the blockchain network. So they have non-distributable non qualities and they protect consumers from receiving um, counterfeit digital assets. As I touched upon previously, they also contribute to market efficiency. So in a typical auction, you would need um, an auction house and you know, everything that comes along with um, a physical auction, but on an NFT, which is sold on a marketplace, it passes directly from, um, to the buyer. So you cut out the intermedi intermediary, you streamline supply chains and thus contribute to market efficiency. And lastly, um, NFTs provide the possibility of dividing an asset, um, <clears throat> dividing the ownership of an asset into fractions. Um, basically, if multiple people want to own the same NFT, you can break it into smaller assets. Um, and the aim is to divide the value of the investment, whether digital or physical, into shared copies. Next slide, please. Uh, the third um, topic we'll cover today is the metaverse. The metaverse, um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about the metaverse. It's frequently covered um, in the media with, with Facebook, uh, re Facebook's rebranding and, um, and their um, ambitious plans for what the metaverse will become. But as far as how to define the metaverse, it is essentially a stimulated digital environment that uses <clears throat> AR, which is augmented reality, uh, VR, virtual reality, and blockchain, along with some social media concepts to create spaces for rich user interaction. And the idea is to mimic the real world. And um, <clears throat> basically it provides a, a place where individuals through their avatars can interact socially and professionally. They can invest in currency, they can take classes, work together and travel all within the metaverse. Um, the idea is to create online spaces where these interactions are more, more multidimensional than current technology supports. And it will not simply allow users to view digital content, but also just immerse themselves in the space. Um, and I, if the metaverse becomes what um, what is promised, the idea is to kind of fuse together the digital and physical world. And for example, um, one, one another aspect is that if you are to uh, buy an asset in the metaverse, th this asset will kind of be attached to your avatar so that if you go from one metaverse to the next, um, the asset follows you. Of course, all of these transactions give rise to the possibility of new disputes. And that is what um, Jill will be covering in the next section. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, 
I, I hope, and uh, if this is not the case, that we've been able to lay the grounds, the technical grounds of what is sometimes perceived as a very technical, austere, uh, not easily understandable uh, word uh, with new um, tech arising. We're not very far from where we were at, at we, where we were at the beginning of the '90s, where people wouldn't know exactly what an email at, uh, was or is, uh, with this you know at sign uh, was being seen everywhere, but no one could understand what it corresponded to, or when you know the hashtag uh, was uh, started uh, being being used here and there. And, and this is a little bit the era we're getting into where things are being more and more talked about, but without everyone knowing exactly what we're talking about, that that's exactly the, the, the point of, um, of our first um, a part, which um, Claire, uh, I hope, um, very clearly covered. If that's not the case, of course, um, we have... Um, uh, a Q&A session, and please don't hesitate to um, to let us know if, uh, uh, technically or legally speaking, you still have uh, questions. Now, let's talk about this new universe of uh, disputes coming from that uh, word which was just uh, described to you. Um, there is this very famous quote. Um, uh, yes, uh, we're, we're, we're not um, yet um, in the, um, the first slide, but le let's leave it this way. Thank you, Jan, don't worry, it's, it's okay. Um, there is a, a very famous uh, quote, which um, basically uh, goes um, the following way, wherever there are human minds transacting, including uh, via technology, there will be disputes. And of course, uh, this new tech word uh, is no exception to, to this principle. Blockchain disputes are appearing in different forms. We, we are going to try to cover some of them. Uh, how can more specifically crypto assets uh, intersect with international arbitration? Um, this is something which we will be covering more narrowly. So we will try to give you some illustrations about the types of disputes and, and then going to the specific question of how those disputes can be handled through arbitration. Abdullah Abu Wasel uh, said, cryptocurrency businesses have been known to include arbitration. Yes, can, can we please move to the next slide? Um, have been known to include arbitration agreements in their contracts, which is unsurprising considering the harmo harmonious nature of both cryptocurrency and international arbitration. Uh, indeed, cryptocurrency, and that applies to blockchain, uh, identifies itself as a decentralized character. And arbitration similarly enjoys the freedom of party autonomy that can be found that cannot be found before national courts. So you see they, those two words, arbitration and uh, blockchain in general, um, have a lot of in common. Party autonomy, a mechanism detached from a territorial, national, or jurisdictional grasp, confidentiality, efficiency, all those things are in common. Um, yet, uh, although we will see typical disputes um, that are not enough, uh, anything new, um, there are very, um, very new uh, types of, of disputes arising. Um, so typically you will, you will find IP uh, disputes, um, which we, we can um, discuss at length, but um, which we want uh, um, uh, more specifically in this webinar, investments, uh, disputes, supply of services, disputes, and uh, fraud disputes here uh, too, you will see that there is nothing that specific. And by fraud, I do mean, um, I do mean uh, issues of misrepresentation, 
issues of uh, uh, identity, identity theft uh, and, and the like. But things are a bit more complicated because um, uh, with crypto assets uh, being a bit different in their nature as this explained by Claire, um, they may involve new types uh, of legal uh, uh, questioning. Uh, simply because those two planets, while, while they are aligned or living one close to the other, they, they do not merge. And one example which we, we can give is that whereas efficiency is really the heart of uh, crypto uh, currencies and blockchain more specifically, um, uh, arbitration is very much concerned as much as uh, by efficiency than it is by due process. And due process would tend to slower things. So you see, um, things cannot be completely uh, compatible or merging. Let's talk about the Bi Binance dispute um, before we, we talk about uh, the, th the three major uh, points I wanted to, to discuss and which you, you see in your slide. And this is quite illustrative of uh, at least uh, some of, of the three uh, blocks you see here. Uh, in the Binance dispute, very well known, um, uh, an investor ha had claimed this, that Binance, uh, Binance's automated liquidation system forced them to sell against their own interest large amounts of a specific coin. Uh, and this is uh, a prime first and very telling example of a commercial arbitration regarding crypto assets. Uh, Binance uh, is known to be a crypto trading platform with offices in Europe and the MENA region. They suffered in May of last year, a power outage causing the platform to fail, leaving users unable to exit their positions as crypto prices were collapsing. So you had hundreds of users, investors commencing arbitration against Binance because in their statutes uh, and articles of associations, you had, uh, um, uh, you had an arbitration clause and they were seeking relief for millions of dollars because uh, of that outage. Um, so while the dispute is um, from what we, we've seen headed by a, a very large international law firm um, with uh, basically a funding uh, by a, a private equity firm, a third party funding. The this dispute is really the first arbitration of its kind, at least known of. Uh, and it will certainly not be uh, the last one. Two of the issues which arose in this arbitration is um, the fact that Binance's states uh, um, that they have no official headquarters. So you had a problem of uh, uh, locating um, where um, the respondent would be. And of course, that's a question of service. And so it's a question of uh, also, to some extent, uh, international dispute or not because of the different nationality of the uh, parties. Another one was to identify the exact uh, party and um, uh, and notably uh, the legal entity be behind B uh, Binance, Binance. And that's another issue as to basically whether the arbitration could proceed because if you file an arbitration against a wrong respondent, you may be dismissed altogether. So that's basically uh, a, a, a sort of starting point so that you see the complexity of some uh, issues arising of uh, uh, those new types of disputes. And uh, it is uh, undeniable that uh, they, there is um, nothing new um, in, on the horizon, uh, exactly as I explained to you, taking the examples of who is the respondent, where it's based, that ha has been seen in many different uh, arbitrations, but you do have um, new um, types of um, legal issues being posed. And you may have heard about the difference between commercial and investment arbitration. 
Um, that's exactly um, the first point uh, discussed in this slide. Um, there is a question of whether uh, in investment arbitration, um, crypto assets can be considered as a protected investment under international law. Uh, we've heard Claire earlier on discussing the legal nature of Bitcoins or cryptocurrencies more generally speaking. Uh, the first question is that, is whether um, it is uh, as a matter of fact, a currency uh, in the first place. Uh, in the affirmative, it, it may be argued uh, that there is an analogy with the notion that money held in a bank ac account could constitute a, a form of protected investment or investment um, full stop. Um, and, and it is true that when you invest in Bitcoins, for example, you do use wallets and you do have a custodian. And perhaps then the question is whether you will aim at more um, the custodian, custodian holding this wallet rather than the cryptocurrency itself. Another sort of argument um, to, to basically uh, allow to uh, consider a crypto asset as a, an investment is to, to say that it's a sort of financial or intangible instrument as uh, often uh, referred to in investment treaties. Um, but here again, um, uh, most uh, if not all of the uh, BITs, even the newest one, would not contemplate that specific um, uh, hypo. And so you would need to have um, some precedence, um, which um, uh, is, is uh, not yet to be seen because you do have some illustrations uh, about that, but to be um, established in a permanent manner. In both cases, uh, when it comes to the crypto assets itself, there is still the territoriality issue uh, and, and requirement. And the fact that certain rights or obligations linked to the assets would have to arise from the in the territory of the host state. And here too, as you uh, we have mentioned, um, cryptocurrencies are detached often uh, and the um, Binance uh, dispute arbitration is an example, are detached from a specific national jurisdiction. Now, a, sort, a second sort of dispute uh, or block of disputes uh, that would show you um, uh, the, the new, the, the, how new um, this new generation of, um, of legal issues may, um, uh, may generate is the valuation issue. Now, uh, valuating cryptocurrency uh, businesses is a challenge due to the lack of comparable publicly listed companies. Uh, you, you probably know that uh, from the very first uh, day when um, we heard the first time about um, a, a cryptocurrency that was, I think, in 2008 by a certain Satoshi Nakamoto, and we don't know whether that person was actually, um, uh, or rather that name was not actually used by another person. Um, in 2008, so more than 14 years ago, um, it, it was said back then uh, that um, that person was working on a new system of e-currency entirely peer-to-peer -peer with no third party of trust able to evaluate it. And um, the first evaluation um, of a Bitcoin was um, from October 2009 at $0.001, which was the exact production cost in electricity for a, a computer to uh, electronically create a unity uh, of uh, that um, so-called currency. In 2013, so four year la years later, um, the Bitcoin value was of 1,000. In 2017, it was of 20,000. Uh, you had, of course, um, the huge rise following the COVID, uh, uh, the co COVID pandemics in uh, starting in March 20, 
um, with um, uh, with uh, a collapse in 2021, but in um, at some point in in 20, uh, I'm sure you've heard that uh, the value of the Bitcoin reached uh, almost 60,000 to collapse last year uh, to 29,000, and the Doge coin uh, was, for example, value um, in 2022. Um, uh, it it um, uh, sorry in 2020 uh, it it has known um, um, a rise in its value uh, multiplied by 139. So you you see it's it's really a roller coaster. We call it in in French train uh, russe. Um, um, so it goes up and down and very violently. And because of that and of that instability, uh, you have really big issues um, of valuation, but also precisely new uh, uh, disputes uh, coming ahead. Uh, just in two, um, 2021, you had two trillion of uh, dollars uh, of value disappearing. Um, but that's a, a real issue in terms of assessing uh, damages, creating disputes, but then trying to assess the exact harm and thus the, the damage. The third issue is an issue of enforcement of uh, arbitral awards. Uh, as you probably know, um, the rising popularity of cryptocurrencies, um, you, uh, with that uh, rising popularity, um, you had um, basically, um, more and more, um, a more uh, uh, an increasing likelihood that awards uh, um, be ordering to pay a sum uh, of crypto uh, instead of US dollars. Is that something uh, feasible? Is that something that uh, is legally possible? Well, the starting point is that you have, except for two, uh, countries, Salvador and Central African Republic, no countries recognizing uh, cryptocurrencies. Actually, some countries have banned, uh, like I think India or Russia, uh, cryptocurrencies altogether. Now, where uh, cryptocurrencies are neither um, prohibited nor permitted, the question of um, whether awards can be recognized uh, can can be actually um, posed. Case law, and this is something that uh, China has been very uh, helpful in, illust in illustrating, um, does not favor the treatment of cryptocurrencies as actual money in decisions. You had a very famous uh, case in which my firm was involved, the Tulip Trading Limited versus Bitcoin Association where um, 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 uh, the, the claimant, um, the Seychelles company, alleged that it had suffered a, a hack. It claimed 4.5 billion from 16 developers, alleging that they owed a fiduciary and common law duties under English law, and they should be required to write and apply a patch to the blockchain network with, with the effect of transferring it, transferring it to a new Bitcoin address that the claimant claimed had been lost due to an alleged hack. So somehow the platform should be liable because of that hack. Uh, but the court determined that this open source Bitcoin software developers whose code is widely adopted and used to trade or store cryptocurrencies do not owe that fiduciary duty. Um, and, and that's simply because um, it is not uh, a very specific um, 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 uh, asset uh, using a specific uh, code or, um, um, uh, or private code, but, but rather a publicly available one. Uh, in, in, in other words, the, the claim was dismissed and um, uh, in, a, in a fraud hack case, uh, this was not very much in favor of um, recognizing uh, a decision um, 
uh, where it was asked that um, um, a security for costs be, um, uh, be deposited before the court. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's referring to my previous point, um, the, 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 the fact that the Bitcoin was subject to a high level of volatility uh, actually led also to, to that, uh, that decision rejecting the security for cost in support of a claimant's claim. Now, uh, you have another ruling from the Chesin Intermediate People's Court in China that also set aside an award that ordered to pay um, the US equivalent to the disputed amount of Bitcoins. Um, uh, by the same token, uh, we have identified other uh, decisions in the Netherlands, in Greece, that for public reasons refused to enforce uh, or recognize the wars based on public uh, policy considerations. And it is true that although uh, you don't have a specific uh, ground, but one could um, easily think that um, uh, considerations relating, relating to the protection of sovereign uh, money and the stability of the financial system could be relied upon as um, reasons uh, for public uh, policy considerations not to recognize an award uh, rendered in uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, I will accelerate just to let you know, um, moving to the next uh, slide, please. Um, Jan, if, if possible. Jan? Yes, the, the next slide, please. Uh, now, it's not just about blockchain being uh, disputes, being the subject matter of arbitration. It can be also about blockchain being used uh, to help um, in the arbitration process. So it's more arbitration being the subject of uh, blockchain rather than uh, the reverse as we, we've just seen. Now, there are three reasons to consider that blockchain can be beneficial for international arbitration. First, cybersecurity. Blockchain uh, could potentially improve cybersecurity as it, it can impede fraudulent activities and detect data tampering based on its underlying characteristics of immutability, data encryptions, and operation resilience. Uh, sorry, re resilience. And basically the, the fact that uh, this is a, a mechanism that is always generating itself. Of course, with cybersecurity, the second consideration is confidentiality. Private permissioned blockchains could be compared to, uh, I quote, organizations, intranet pages, where information is only shared and exchanged internally with those who have been permitted to access, to access the site. So you do have a way basically to, to lock uh, in everyone participating in an arbitration and make sure that the information is not shared outside this uh, limited scope of people. Efficiency. IBM uh, uh, signifies the smart contracts built um, on the blockchain um, uh, might have that those smart contracts that uh, Claire has referred to and explained have the ability to reduce the time consumed in dispute resolution by 75%. And as you probably know, a way to resolve some contract disputes is what we call contract management. And contract management is also led to what we call dispute boards, especially in construction disputes. And there are the first phase before going to, to arbitration. So it can help uh, by using smart contracts to basically resolve disputes even before going to a dispute per se. Um, so one thing that is, is important to bear in mind before I move quickly to questions of re related to NFTs is that uh, you have um, a, a sort of um, um, 
uh, a new era opening here. Uh, the U UK Ministry of Justice began to discuss the possibility of blockchain technologies application in judicial practices. And in 2018, Chinese courts have already set up a blockchain system 2017. And you have in 2018 and 2019, courts in China confirming uh, that for the first time that electronic data stored on the blockchain could be treated as electronic evidence. And even data, not just stored, but generated by the blockchain could be um, recognized as, uh, um, as having the characteristics of authentic authenticity and integrity. Moving to NFTs, and I will close um, with, with that. Um, perhaps if we can move to the next uh, slide, Jan. Thank you. Um, we, we have organized uh, a few months ago a, a webinar, a hybrid actually webinar, and at the same time it was um, uh, in, in our venue in Paris on NFTs, blockchain also, and we had invited people from WIPO in Switzerland and the Court of Arbitration for Arts uh, so that they could share their experience as to whether NFTs, especially in the world of uh, arts, could be um, uh, creatures leading to new types of disputes. And there are indeed three uh, or at least two main uh, types of, of uh, disputes um, art related. You have potential claims by holders of rights uh, in underlying works. And this is something we can of course expand on. And you have potential claims uh, for uh, buyers of uh, NFTs uh, who um, could basically, um, uh, who, could who would consider that uh, they weren't informed sufficiently well about what they were buying and the scope of the rights they were enjoying when uh, buying an NFT. Um, uh, those have, uh, disputes have not been uh, illustrated by um, arbitrations, rather uh, you have, as Claire mentioned, you have had some very well-known disputes um, in um, uh, going to public courts, but there are also um, interesting issues relating to um, the jurisdictional scope of regulatory, um, uh, regulatory frames. As you probably know, uh, whether we consider data protection or financial regulation, there is the question of its territorial application. And again, with NFTs, as uh, oftentimes they are not easily attached to a specific jurisdiction, there is the question of um, uh, whether you are to apply those regulations or not. Um, next slide, please. The, um, uh, that's uh, that's the the two types of um, NFT disputes I just mentioned. Um, putting aside uh, the the question of um, of regulation, which I mentioned, so you do have the two types of disputes. And next slide, uh, Jan, please. Um, you have the new metaverse uh, disputes arising, and um, very conc concretely being seen in the metaverse. So first you have claims by users against metaverse platforms. Uh, oftentimes they will uh, re relate to real estate disputes. Uh, you know, you buy a, a plot, a virtual plot, um, and then you discover that its, its value has decreased because um, uh, for example, uh, a, a further plot was created uh, nearby, whereas the, the platform use, uh, said at the beginning that you would enjoy basically some sort of exclusivity, exactly like you would see in the real world. Um, you would have also issues of disruption of businesses. Um, and this is not something um, that is very typical to the metaverse uh, universe. We've seen and, and talked about that concerning um, NFTs or uh, cryptocurrencies. But what may be interesting 
uh, and maybe specific to the metaverse, metaverse as far as claims by users against metaverse platforms are uh, issues relating to the inability to withdraw funds. Users may want to realize profits made on the metaverse platform in real world uh, currencies. But decentralized blockchain platforms allow users to sell their in-world currency on cryptocurrency exchanges, most centralized in, uh, 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 by most centralized uh, metaverse platforms. And those uh, platforms would not provide functionality to allow users to cash out of their in-platform currency. So you make profits in the virtual world, you want to transform this into real cash money, and you are unable to. And that's typically a, a sort of claim that you have seen uh, and you will see increasingly in the future. Uh, you have many other types of claims uh, by users against other users, exactly like the NFT um, type of disputes which, which we mentioned. And I will conclude uh, with three um, or rather two um, uh, issues um, or implications for international arbitration in the metaverse. One ha has to do with arbitrator uh, trust and anonymity. There's a question of the anonymity of the parties in, in the metaverse because you use basically an avatar, you don't know who is behind that avatar. But it poses a more fundamental uh, issue when you don't know who is uh, the arbitrator behind um, the decision rendered. and. Basically, um, it is true that some have precisely gone down this road and said, um, actually, we should have an anonymous, an anonymous uh, crowdsourced online arbitration where people are selected on an anonymous basis without knowing who is uh, their identity, uh, but only relying on their expertise. Um, and this is also what we've seen in blockchain arbitration, um, uh, pioneered by applications such as Claris, uh, where a network of uh, anonymous human jurors on the blockchain randomly selected based on the amount they have they, they stake to be selected, where the higher amount, the greater the chance of random selection. And the system uh, in the system, anyone can be a juror. And you have had some awards, arbitral awards rendered on that basis, which were not recognized precisely because of this random characteristic, which was in breach of what we called due process. And as a result, um, it was considered that it was breaching a procedural public policy. So you see, you have some, um, questions, um, uh, whereas at the same time, arbitration is based on trust, blockchain is based on trust, but at the same time, the two things are not necessarily compatible. And I will leave the floor to, um, to Claire to just to, to finish by giving us some examples of orders um, that can be uh, found in the, the context of, of arbitration as illustrations. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, one of the challenges in uh, cryptocurrency disputes is where there is an award that is rendered in a party's favor. Question is then how does that party, um, how does that party get its money? Um, so there are a few tools that parties can rely on. Uh, the Mariva injunction, uh, Norwich orders, or um, Anton Pillar orders. And just to give an example, a Mariva injunction basically has the effect of freezing um, the defendant's assets worldwide and prevents the defendant from utilizing those assets, except for regulatory purposes, such as to pay the salaries of its employees. And also as part of this injunction, there is a, a, an asset disclosure order. So if the defendant's assets exceed a certain amount, then they would be required to disclose that amount. This is just an example of, of how um, 
uh, how to actually um, uh, get to receive the money that is uh, that is awarded. Um, another way is, for example, Jill touched upon the challenges of jurisdiction. For example, if the seat of the arbitration has laws which are not favorable to cryptocurrency, um, which even might even ban outright the trading of cryptocurrency, one way around this is to um, to stipulate in the award that the um, award can be satisfied with a currency of equal value, um, US dollars, for example, to the um, amount of cryptocurrency that is awarded. So that's one another way around um, these kind of challenges. Thanks, Claire. I, I, um, I think we can expand a lot on, on, um, on all those uh, new types of disputes, although I, I, we did mention the fact that they were not that new at, at the same time. Um, the, the reality is that uh, um, we are starting to, to, to see um, interesting legal issues, again, not fundamentally new, but which will pose um, very um, genuine uh, new uh, legal issues. Um, I think we, we, we touched upon the question of the anonymity of the arbitrators or of the parties. And I think there is a question um, in the Q&A box, um, one, um, one of which is the following, are there any law firms and or arbitrators who accept their fees in cryptocurrency? Well, uh, to be honest, um, I can tell you that um, as far as I'm concerned, I have never seen that. Uh, this was never proposed to me. We did um, uh, we did discuss this uh, a few um, months ago with some centers, uh, and I do remember. Uh, I think uh, uh, a conference, a seminar, a webinar organized by the HKIC uh, during the Paris Arbitration Week, where a question was posed whether the HKIC was willing to pay. Um, um, uh, to be to, to accept payment in uh, cryptocurrencies, and they said this has not happened yet. So um, to um, uh, to answer the first question, does that exist uh, or not? We we're not sure, uh, but um, we haven't seen anything like that. Does there is there anything that would uh, prevent? arbitrators or law firms from accepting? Well, yes, depending on the uh, applicable regulation in the relevant country. Um, I, I think uh, I, I can see here that HKRB would like to answer this question live. Oh, yeah, okay, which, which we just did. And there's a second question. How does one ensure blockchain arbitrators are fair? Well, that touches upon also the same question. Uh, which um, we covered a few um, a few minutes ago uh, about whether and, and you remember the um, parallel with jurors, uh, which um, which we mentioned. I, I, it is um, it is a true a true uh, uh, question. Um, how do we want um, it, it? It basically relates to the trust. Uh, we put in the arbitration system, especially, for example, the arbitration center, and whether we trust uh, that center in appointing the right person. Uh, do we need to know the identity of the arbitrator necessarily in this new generation of dispute? I would say, in general, trust is based on um, information and having sufficient information. and. Um, Although, as you probably know, a lot of people have been uh, advocating the, the fact that you could have sometimes blind appointments or um, uh, appoint direct appointments by the centers without the party uh, parties being able to appoint, so to speak, their arbitrator. Um, I, at the same time, um, this is probably the limit of the um, uh, of the trust you can you can give to the whole system, and to some extent, uh, not knowing who's going to be the arbitrator rendering the uh, 
the award is um, is uh, is probably a, a, a limit. Um, whether this could be accepted, would the, whether this could be legally possible, uh, is a is another issue because the New York Convention does require that you have a, a physical person rendering the uh, the award. So this is uh, uh, this could be an impediment. But can the parties waive this right in um, in the rules? Uh, in the institutional rules they accept in the arbitration agreement, this uh, remains to be seen. I think those were the two questions uh, we had to, to tackle. Uh, Jan, Vod, is there anything um, else you see um, we, yes, we could address? Uh, well, I, 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 I was about to say, can you hear me? Good? Very well. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Vod. I was about to say um, there have been uh, so many questions. Uh, posting to you uh, without me as a moderator to ask you a question, but I still have one uh, pressing question uh, I'd like to put forward, if I may. Um, well, what if uh, an arbitral award is rendered in a party, party's favor in a cryptocurrency dispute? How could a party, the winning party, so-called, would ensure that uh, he or she can receive the uh, so-called uh, award uh, cryptocurrencies uh, uh, award uh, down the road uh, in terms of enforcement. Would you like to enlighten me? Of course, I, I think we've somehow covered this. Claire, perhaps you want to say a few words about this hypo? Sure. So um, your question goes back to the um, to the tools that I that I cover very briefly. So the Mariva injunction, um, which is the worldwide freezing order and asset disclosure order. That's the one I detailed a bit. Um, the other one, the other tools that parties can rely on are, is a Norwich order, which is um, an injunctive order, which basically calls on um, an innocent third party to disclose um, information in order to identify the wrongdoer. For example, um, we might call upon the cryptocurrency exchange to get information about the um, the, tr the transaction that happened um, and um, details related to crypto wallets and digital assets. That's one way to get, so it's not a freezing order, but it's a way to get information. Um, the third tool, which I mentioned very briefly, is the Anton Pillar order, which is a common law remedy, uh, which allows actually a defendant, uh, so it compels the defendant to allow the plaintiff to enter its property uh, to search for and seize evidence and records. So this includes, because, because we're talking about cryptocurrency, it includes electronic data and um, equipment. So again, not- and This was you, this was used in Canada, right, Claire? In yes, Victoria. it was used in, um, it was, um, the, such an order was issued by the Ontario Superior Court in relation to the theft of 15 million Canadian dollars of digital assets from the plaintiff's crypto wallet. So these tools have already been put into practice. So you see what there are ways to basically enforce and, and get some securities if, um, um, if one uh, um, wants to deploy the means uh, to do just that. Interesting indeed. Um, uh, I have to say that um, uh, this is a, uh, a quite an uncharted area uh, in many jurisdictions. Uh, as far as I know, uh, I, I trust that many, um, uh, all, many of us uh, here would like to learn more from both of you. Thank you so much again. Uh, I, I have to put my hands together to appreciate uh, your sh uh, sharing uh, in this uh, webinar. And of course, uh, um, I like to remind all audience that um, the uh, Law Society CPD has been applied and uh, we will uh, send you an email to confirm uh, such uh, information down the road. And also all uh, audience, uh, please uh, submit uh, your evaluation uh, to your honor after watching uh, this uh, webinar. And uh, personally speaking, um, and uh, uh, Claire and Jerry, I, 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 I may come to Paris uh, in February. And uh, if that's the case, uh, certainly I will have a coffee with you. 
will be more than happy to welcome you in Paris. Great, great. I, I, I look forward to seeing you uh, in February. Thank you so much again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. See you. Bye.